Bruchim Aboim. Um, this will be the third lecture on prayer, but this is a little bit different. We are right on the uh, days just before Rosh Hashanah. And uh, I thought it'd be proper to uh, talk about prayer in conjunction with the Yom Adin, with these 10 days of repentance, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. And again, they're called the Day of Judgment. And it's interesting, uh, every year we have Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, where we stand before God and we pray on our sins. But the question is why? I mean, there was a belief that when a person dies, there's a final day of uh, reckoning, where we have to answer for all the deeds that we've done in this world. So why is it that every year we also have a Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur where we deal with this idea of being judged? And how do we see that? Um, there's a story told of a, uh, of a man who was very close to the king. He and the king were the best of friends. And um, he had a business venture. And he went to the king to borrow a million dollars. And at the same time, there was another servant of the king who also approached the king for a million dollar loan. And the king, being a benevolent ruler, granted them both this million dollar loan, and actually with no interest. But he, and he gave them 20 years to pay it off. That at the end of 20 years, one million dollars would be due. And the king was very clear. He told both of these individuals that I'm giving you a million dollars and I expect to be paid on the date of this loan, 20 years from now. And if you're late, and if you're off by any amount, it'll cost you your life. And they both agreed to the conditions and they left. And it was interesting, about 40 days before the loan the first year, the, the friend of the king hears something about a payment that he's going to have to make. It's a letter. And then 10 days before the date of the loan being due, the messenger comes from the king. And he says, the king expects you to give him $50,000 this year and every year thereafter. And the friend of the king was very confused. He said, "I king said a million dollars after 20 years. What's this 50000 for? And he said, this is what the king said to me, I don't know, 50000 every year. King says, so he does it. About 10 years into this program, he manages to, to get the 50000 every year. And after about 10 years, he bumps into this other man who also borrowed the million. And they're talking, and he says, how are you handling this $50,000 payment plan? And the man fa faces blank. He says, what $50,000 plan? He says, aren't you paying the king $50,000 every year? He says, no, the king said the whole thing a million dollars at the end of the 20 years. He says, really? And he goes to see the king. And he says to the king, he says, I thought we were the best of friends. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the king says... I love you more than anyone else in the world. You're the closest friend I have. He says, I don't get it. You're pushing me for 50000 every year, and this guy who's a stranger, you're going to let him pay the whole thing at the end of the 20 years. Why are you pushing me? And the king says, you know, the time for the debt is coming this year, on the 11th year. Make sure that you pay it. And he dismisses him. 20th year comes, and the king himself comes to see his friend, and he says, your last payment is due. And he says, if you have any problem, I'll, not a problem, I'll even help you. But I want you to come anyways after you make the payment. And I want you to be there at the court when this other man has to pay me the, the million dollars. And on that day, the friend comes to the court, and sure enough, the other person comes with excuses and reasons why he had the money, he's a little short on the money, he needs a little bit more time, and while he's saying that to the king, the executioner takes his head off. And the king turns to his friend, and he says, I was afraid that would be you. See, it's very easy to borrow a million. It's very hard to pay it. 
and I was afraid you wouldn't have the ability to pay the loan. So every year I took a little bit of it to pay it off. So when the final time came, you'd be able to easily take care of the last payment and you wouldn't lose your life. And God Almighty also does the same with us. Every year he lets us pay down the debt. Every year the misdeeds that we do, the money that we borrow from him, that which we take on credit that God gives us that are over and above the merits that we have, he lets us pay down so that when that final day of judgment comes, we'll be able to pass the test and receive our reward in the next world. So how are we to understand? So really, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur is really what we call Chesh Ben Nefesh, an accounting of the soul. Just like a business takes inventory, during these 40 days, and especially coming into the 10 days of repentance, we take inventory to see how we did compared to last year. And if we're honest, we realize that we're going to God just like the businessman goes to the banker and asks for credit. And we hope that just like the businessman, God will give us another year, a blessed year, a good year, a healthy year, a prosperous year. But the problem is we don't have a lot of merits. So what we try to do is we try to convince God that we'll be better this year than we were last year. And the hope is that we do that. But the problem is, there's a Pusik in the Torah that says, The thing is very close to you. In your mouth, in your heart, so to do it. And when we stand in front of God Almighty, every year, it's interesting, we talk about getting better, and we think about getting better. We even talk to other people about it. But if you really are honest with yourself, more often than not, the things that you're saying this year are the same things you said last year and the year before and the year before that in your mouth and in your thoughts. And where do these feelings of tshuva, of repentance, come from? Side of good. Maybe not. Maybe it's a side of evil. Maybe he understands that if you don't have some feelings of talking about it and thinking about it, that you're actually going to have to do something. But if you talk about it, and you think about it, you feel righteous. Example I always give, health clubs, 10,000 members, 300 lockers. New Year's, everybody has a resolution, I'm going to work out this year. And maybe for a week, most people, not much longer than that at all, they go to the health club, they work out. And by halfway through the month, the end of the month, you can get anything you want. Right after New Year's, people come but they don't follow through. And that's what the Sutton, that's what the side of evil does. He wants you to feel righteous. But what we need to do to counteract him is that we need to change something and not change everything. When you want to change everything, that's the side of evil talking to you. Change something. Change something. And when you change something and the next year comes and you've changed something that gives you the power the determination, the strength to change something else. And little by little, you change the one thing in life that you can change. And the only thing in life that you can change is yourself. Because what we try to do is change everything else around us, except ourselves. If you can change yourself, I'll tell Geber, who's a strong person, not one who conquers a city, but one who conquers himself. And that's what Chuv is about. It's about changing something. Life is a marathon. We are all sprinters. We get good for a minute, and then we run out of gas. The side of evil is a marathon runner. He just keeps coming. It's about 365 days, 24 hours a day. It's about staying the course, never giving up. Sheva Tipal Tzadik would come. You fall, you get up. Seven times a righteous person falls, but he gets up. Of you being the terminator, of just staying the course. Sports teaches you that all the time. See a team that's losing, and you think they're done, they just stay the course, somehow they win. Just stay determined, stay on course. But take something to change that you can literally do, and that'll give you the strength to continue. But what do we pray for? 
The Rebbe Lublin says, rather than pray for our own difficulties, pray for God. For God? Yeah, pray for God. The Gemara Sanhedrin says, or Mayor says, when a person is distressed, what does the Shekhinah, what does the divinity of God say? If it were possible, it would say, my head is heavy. Meaning to say that when you suffer, the Shekhinah, the divinity of God suffers. It's connected to you. When we pray, angels scrutinize our prayers to see if we deserve, if we were good enough, do we have merit. But they cannot turn away prayers for God. As we say, Kosvenu b'sefer achayim, one of the prayers that we add during the liturgy and the Shmon Esrei and the standing prayer during the days of repentance. Write me in the book of life. Why? The mancha elokim chayim. Because of the king, because of the of God of life. Do it for God. Don't do it for me. We're praying for God so the shechina will not be in pain. That angels cannot argue with. So when a person prays, help me so that the divinity of God, God Almighty, does not suffer because I'm suffering. Because no father wants to see his child suffer. There's no greater pain. That prayer cannot be turned away. Pray for Mashiach. We pray for, most prayers are really for money, some for good health. But it's basically money. But the truth of the matter is, if a person prays for Mashiach, for Messiah to come, it takes care of all problems. It's a blanket that covers everything. Why try to pinpoint every little thing? You don't have time. You're not going to stay that focused. Just pray for Mashiach. It's a time of peace, a time of goodness, a time of plenty. It takes care of everything that you need. The truth of the matter is, the greatest prayer you have is pray for someone else. You know, there was a man who lost his money, and he had to go begging door to door. And he sees a fence, and he has to open the door, and he can hear it creaking. And then he walks up the, the walk, and he can feel, hear his feet cl clomping on the cement. And when he knocks on the door, he's very gentle. He's hoping the person doesn't answer. When the person does, they give him a few pennies, or they slam the door in his face. And he, and he knows he needs to go next door, but he can't. But his friend sees him as he walks with his head down to go home. And his friend opens up that same door and just pushes it open. And he runs up the walk. And he bangs on the door. And when the man comes to the door and he tries to put his foot in the, to close the door, he puts his foot in the door. When he tries to give him a few pennies, he says, are you crazy? This man has a family. You've got to give me more than that. And the man is forced to give him more. And what does he do? Even before the man closes that door, he's running across the lawn to the next house. There's no embarrassment because he's praying, he's taking care of his friend. And that's what we all need to do. Pray for someone else. We are one body. Look at someone else's pain. Look at someone else's problem. We may not deserve, but he does. Everyone is God's child, and God is a parent, and God has an achrayut. He has a responsibility to take care of his children. And we can demand that of him. Us? Maybe not. I've overdrawn the account. Okay, you've given me more than I deserve. But not that person. He is your child. And the prayer that we give to God is of vinu malkenu, our father, our king. And what you pray to is the father. And a father cannot say no, especially when God puts us into this world, Ram and Arav, evil from birth. If he wants us to be good, he should have made us good. If he made us evil, it's his responsibility. And what we need to do is make God stand and take care of his children. And if we pray with those thoughts for other people, and not worry what page we're on, and not worry about how long it is, just know that if we say the words, we will open the gates of prayer. And with that, we'll have a better year. And hopefully, all the world will be a better place to, to live in. And praying for the world is what it's about, not about yourself. May God bless you all with a happy and healthy year to you and all that uh, you come to. Thank you. God bless and be well. Thank you for coming.